Welcome to AstroCast.TV, your source for news and information about astronomy and our solar system. Now, here's your host, NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, Greg Redfern. It's episode four, and we're off to the red planet Mars and NASA's Phoenix mission. Also, AstroCast.TV science advisor, Dr. Harold Geller will be answering some of your email questions. And from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., I'll be talking to Katie Moore, who will give us a night sky update for the month of July. 5411, or a 454 average, isn't bad for a baseball hitter. But it's pretty tough odds, though, if you are sending a spacecraft that costs hundreds of millions of dollars and took years to build to the planet Mars. Only five of 11 landing attempts on Mars have been successful. Those were the odds that NASA's Phoenix mission team faced on May 25, 2008, as their spacecraft prepared for the infamous seven minutes of terror. This marks a time period known as entry, descent, and landing, or EDL for short. In those seven minutes, Phoenix has to survive entry into the Martian atmosphere, going about 12,750 miles per hour, and work perfectly during descent and landing to reach the Martian surface and touchdown. There is no room for error, no second chance during EDL. Your spacecraft either makes it or dies trying. After a voyage of 422 million miles, a radio signal from Phoenix was received at 7.53 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time that indicated the spacecraft had safely touched down 15 minutes earlier. It took the signal that much time to traverse the 170 million miles between the two planets. Phoenix uses hardware from a spacecraft built for a 2001 launch that was canceled in response to the loss of a similar Mars spacecraft during a 1999 landing attempt. Researchers who proposed the Phoenix mission in 2002 saw the unused spacecraft as a resource for pursuing a new science opportunity. Earlier in 2002, Mars Odyssey discovered that plentiful water ice lies just beneath the surface throughout much of the high-latitude Mars. NASA chose the Phoenix proposal over 24 other proposals to become the first endeavor in the Mars Scout program of competitively selected missions. During its three-month mission, Phoenix will search for subsurface Martian water and then look for habitats supportive of life in the Martian soil. An area in the Martian Arctic Plain was chosen as a landing site due to a lack of large rocks and because of the Mars Odyssey water ice data. Phoenix cameras image what may be ice directly underneath the spacecraft and trenching operations with a robotic arm have begun in this area called Wonderland. Comparison of photos taken on different days show the disappearance of dice cube sized white material. Scientists theorize that this could be water ice vaporized by the sun as salt would not do this. Phoenix is analyzing its first Martian soil sample and has not found the presence of water ice during initial tests. Because the soil was so clumpy, which was a surprise to scientists, it took several days to get it into a small oven for heating and analysis. Scientists think it is possible that the delay allowed the sun to remove any water ice presence. Phoenix has seven more ovens available for testing new samples. We'll keep you posted on future episodes of what's going on with Phoenix Mars Lander. Supernova 2008D is a supernova recently detected and for the first time photographed by NASA's Swift X-ray Telescope. To help us explain this event and the Swift X-ray Telescope, I'd like to welcome Dr. Derek Fox, Assistant Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Penn State University. Derek, welcome to AstroCast.TV. I'm happy to be here. Uh, first question, uh, were we in just the right place at the right time to capture Supernova 2008D? Uh, the SWIFT satellite was in the, absolutely the right place at the right time. It was looking at the galaxy NGC 2770, where the supernova went off, at the very instant that it exploded. So it, it was able to catch it in the act with its, um, its X-ray telescope instrument. Now, in your opinion, Derek, how do you think SWIFT has added to our knowledge of the universe? Well, in a whole slew of different ways. Um, it's providing a lot of uh, gamma ray burst detections for us to follow up, which has led to the discovery of the most distant cosmic explosion that occurred less than a billion years after the Big Bang. It 
that's led to, as I said, the resolution of the mystery of the short gamma ray bursts. It's also um, provided us with the naked eye gamma ray bursts, the single brightest optical phenomenon that astronomers have ever seen. That was earlier this year. And then the observation of supernova 2008D, the birth of a supernova caught in the act. And on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, it continues to monitor the behavior of supernovae in the nearby universe and many uh, X-ray binaries within our own galaxy. That's quite a resume for any observatory in space. Derek, I want to thank you so much for joining us on astrocast.tv. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Dr. Derek Fox, Assistant Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Penn State University. Now, let's go to Katie Moore from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum to get our night sky update for the month of July. Thanks, Greg. This July, the red planet is visible low in the west just after sunset until the end of the month when it gets more and more difficult to see near the glare of the sun. Mars is approaching the point in its orbit where it's at its greatest distance from Earth, so it appears as just a small dot in our telescopes. You can observe a conjunction of Mars and Saturn on the 10th of July. The two planets will be within less than one degree of one another, as viewed from our home planet, even though they are more than a billion kilometers apart from one another. Even though Mars quickly ducks below the horizon after a short showing in the early evenings this month, a star that the ancient Greeks called the rival of Mars takes center stage during the summer. Mars was the Romans' name for the god of war, but the Greek counterpart was Ares. The rival of Mars, then, is Antares, and that's what we call the star today. Antares is a red supergiant star in the constellation Scorpius. The bright red light from Antares gives it a similar appearance to the red planet. In addition, Antares is close to the ecliptic, that's the path that the sun, moon, and planets take across the sky. So occasionally, Mars's trek through the constellations takes it near Antares. Antares is the brightest star in Scorpius, the Scorpion, and the 16th brightest star in the nighttime sky. To find the Scorpion, look for a J shape of stars with the Scorpion's tail going down toward the southeast and a pair of claws pointing upward. People in different cultures often see different pictures and the same groupings of stars, depending on things that are important to them, are prominent in their daily lives. The Greeks saw this group of stars as a scorpion, while people in Polynesian cultures saw a fish hook. The fish hook is, easily t is easy to imagine by simply connecting the dots. Now back to Greg Redfern. Katie Moore from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Thanks, Katie. Now let's go to the College of Science Showcase at George Mason University where Dr. Harold Geller will take some of your questions. Thank you, Greg, and welcome to George Mason University's College of Science Showcase here in Fairfax, Virginia. We are four stories directly beneath the Herschel Observatory where I've spoken to you before. I'm again going to address questions addressed to astrocast.tv. From Chris, we have this question. I heard on another program that former astronaut Harrison Schmidt is involved in a company to mine helium-3 on the moon. I also hear that the Russians are planning to do the same. What is helium-3 and what makes it so rare here on Earth and so plentiful on the moon? Well, Chris, helium-3 is what's called an isotope of the atom helium. The commonly occurring helium is helium-4, containing two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus. Helium-3 has two protons and just one neutron in the nucleus of a helium-3 atom. The reason that it's more commonly found on the surface of the moon and soil is because of the solar radiation that we call the solar wind. Unlike the Earth, which has a protective atmosphere and a magnetosphere, the moon lacks both of these, and the interactions of the solar wind with its surface creates more of the helium-3 form of the atom helium. The reason that there's an interest in helium-3 is it's believed that helium-3 can be used in a man-made fusion generator on the surface of the moon. If we have that, we have an energy source for all of our astronauts going on the surface of the moon. Don't forget, if you have a question, address it to astrocast.tv and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Now back to Greg Redfern. Thank you, Harold. That's all the time we have for this episode. Tune in next time as we learn more about the wonders and mysteries of the universe in which we live and explore.